Robert Heffern and Manja.tv. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Les Mathers. Now Les, uh, I mean, to the truth be told, we're together because of a picture from 1952 that's been in my family. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, Les Mathers uh, from Mason City, Illinois. And he uh, is the steward of Leveldale Farms. So give us just a little background of Leveldale Farms from a historical perspective um, and where it came from, the name maybe, and a little bit of the history. Sure. Well, the farming of our family started on my father's side of the family uh, moving out from Ohio, southern Ohio, around Cincinnati, and started farming in the, just outside of Mason City a few miles uh, in what they started calling Leveldale Farms a low, flat area, uh, and they started farming there in 1852, uh, kind of a, a jack of all trades. He and his wife moved out and had uh, kids, and their kids had kids, and uh, uh, my grandfather uh, was born in 1890 out on the farm, and his brother in 1889, and uh, so for the last five generations, We've been farming in that same general area, uh, and uh, just a uh, ongoing uh, thing. I, of course, know much more about the last two or three generations, but they kept very good track of things. I think that might have been part of being in farming, and so important about genetics even then with livestock. I think they kept track of what went on in families and throughout right. the years too, so you can trace people back a long ways uh, coming to the United States. And uh, they were uh, characters, uh, worked very hard, uh, cared a lot about the land and the animals they raised, and raised uh, shorthorn cattle right out of the gate, but also had other kinds of cattle, horses, uh, hogs, chickens, raised all sorts of fruit, vegetables, uh, as well as classic corn and soybeans and other things over time. Right. Uh, my grandfather's grandfather was also a blacksmith part of the time. No, oh, because so there they, wasn't enough work right, on the farm. That's right. They had to be, they worked seven days a week uh, for generation <laughs> right. after generation. All right, so you said that uh, they had the shorthorn breed early on. Uh, any idea how that decision came about? Was there a, now my grandfather and his brothers, they argued feverishly over, over breeds, uh, you know, shorthorn, um, Angus, you know, whatever it was, and, and they parted their ways uh, in an argument over what was the best cattle breed. So how did shorthorn become Leveldale's well, choice? I can only go with what I've been told over time, obviously not being there, but the, the shorthorn breed, uh, or as they were often called a few hundred years ago, the Durhams, okay. that came out of Scotland and Northern England were the first breed brought to the United States. So Angus and Herefords came after that. And the shorthorn breed uh, had some characteristics uh, that the others didn't have. Uh, they were stronger, could be beasts of burden as well. Uh, they milked more. Uh, so they could, they could be dual purpose cattle if they wanted to. They could be raised for beef, raised for milk, and even used you know, with in the labor field. in mind in the field really? early on. Okay. Now the cattle we have today still are more rugged and deal with high altitudes and all sorts of things better than many of the other breeds of cattle. Uh, iron ironically, really, because they came from a low altitude area. Right. But uh, they seem to adapt to high altitudes better than most breeds uh, as well today as we've sold many cattle into Colorado and other areas in the states. and. Uh, last many years. Is there anything else uh, genetically about the breed as far as characteristics of the meat? Um, well, they, they tend to be uh, tender and uh, well marbled uh, for giving you the, the taste uh, that people really want. Uh, so they, they give that output of high-end quality uh, at very, very well. Now, a lot of Angus and Herefords do too. Uh, the other thing that shorthorns do is they tend to be a breed that has great dispositions. So working with the cattle, you're not near as likely to get injured right. as if you're dealing with some of those other breeds. 
Herefords also have good dispositions generally. Right. Uh, but but they, they put the package together very well with very good tasting beef. And they grow rapidly, convert the grass, right. and raise calves very well. Our calves in our farm, we don't even pre-feed. That means we don't feed additionally uh, while they're growing up. They just drink their mom's milk and eat the grass besides their mom until they get old enough to be weaned. Really? So, okay. so we, we, we keep very good track on the performance of all these cattle and have for decades. So we know, and we do things like uh, weigh and measure you know, at birth and uh, at periodic intervals during their life. And then when they're at roughly a year old, we do ultrasound testing on all our bulls and our heifers as well to know their carcass quality, how much marbling they have, how big their ribeye is. Really? You can do uh, Yes, we've done that for decades. So we sort them and use genomic testing. And one of my other career roles is I'm a physician. Okay. And as a medical doctor, we're doing more genomic testing and understanding all the time. And I always enjoy talking with other medical people because actually I was doing it far earlier right. with the beef cattle. I was, so you guys have come from a scientific approach to it for a long, long time. I would say that's fairly true. Uh, my, uh, well, I was the first uh, non-ag school grad in my family for four generations of the guys, all the way back to the 1880s. Every one of them, every guy in the family went through the ag school at right. the University of Illinois. The women went through college too, all the way back then. Really? And most of them in education, uh, one in nursing, others in other areas, some business graduates. And uh, so it, it was always uh, a, a big push in my family for education. Right. All right, so that, that kind of segues nicely to uh, a question that my brother had, knowing that I was going to have the opportunity to speak with you, and uh, just about the, when, you, when somebody says that the farm has been in the, the family since the 1850s, you could talk a little bit about the, the challenges for that generational transfer of land, of the farming practice, and how your family every family is different, has different personalities, different interests of kids. Uh, we've been quite fortunate in that regard. And uh, I, you know, I mean, grew up walking the fields and hearing the history. We have some pasture ground that is in this Leveldale farm from 1852, part of it, that's never been tilled. Really? They, they, they never tilled it. They kept it pasture. Uh, so that's forever. It's truly like it, Illinois Prairie. It really is. Wow. Now we, we till most of the ground, right. and rotate crops, and uh, have always been real active in conservation and uh, do a lot of things in moving the livestock around to try to help the quality of the ground and make sure there's not unnecessary runoff of water and mm -hmm. washing of soils and that sort of thing uh, away. But uh, we've been, been fortunate that uh, people preserved uh, things and then uh, often family members sold to other family members and uh, you know there's turnover of parts of the parcels over time but right. uh, you know we, my sister and I still farm a little bit over 2,000 acres together and we've added some to that and others have gone to other part of the family but a lot of it uh, right. still goes back to the original farm ground and it's close by. Well, that is just, it's awesome to hear that, uh, hear that story. It really is. And, uh, all right, so let's talk about the picture a little bit. Sure. Um, I have multiple pictures. You have a little custodian. I've got all his record through the ages and how he won all these fairs, all these state fairs uh, in 1952. 1952, just to give you a little uh, rundown, I mean, this is like the 85 bears, this, this bull. Phoenix. Denver, San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth. I gotta, you know, I wish my grandfather was here because he didn't show them at all of them. I'm not sure which one he ended up picking them up at or if he picked them up in 1953. Well, he, he purchased them in the 52 sale. So about half of the shows would have been complete at that time. All right, so yes. that's the picture. 
And it's my grandfather and my Aunt Margaret who couldn't join us today, and that's your grandfather. That's correct. That's the first Les Mathers. The first Les Mathers. The first thing that just jumps out at me is how short the animal is compared to today. That's correct. The first time I saw this picture, I thought to myself, is that a, is that a cow or a, or a lab or a, you know, a Newfoundland dog? And sure. Sure. So, I mean, what was the uh, average height, or if you know, or, I mean, was that, let me ask you this, genetics, they were short cows, at what point did, did the breeding and the genetics start to go towards taller, at least taller cows? Well, I'll back it up even a little bit more. The cattle were uh, as big frame score wise, size, that meaning kind of their height and across, uh, in the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and it was really mostly post World War II and it's like so many things in life uh, people uh, whether they're in agriculture or other things often go after one trait and get hung up on one thing but uh, actually college professors were pitching that, that women wanted smaller cuts of beef and we should make cattle smaller, they were too big. So uh, the size dramatically changed around World War II and post-World War II to these much shorter animals and then started getting bigger again in the 70s, primarily in the late 70s okay. and into the 80s. Uh, by the late 80s, they were much taller than they are today. So do you do that on a genetic basis just from the, the, the size of the offspring and keeping the smaller ones for the That's what a lot of people were doing, right? Yes. And uh, I can remember uh, watching a cattle show a few decades ago when my grandfather was winning some award and he was in his 90s and, and uh, they wanted to give him this. And then he, he couldn't resist giving a little bit of a speech talking about the, the how all that air underneath them wasn't any added value. <laughs> and, and, I like and, it. And so that actually did change back and, and became different. But uh, I think often we have to make sure, and that's what we try to do in our program, is pay attention to many traits, not just focus on one. Right. Because it's not just growth. It's not just the size, whether they're tall or short, but it's how well they do things on low maintenance and take care of themselves and reproduce and as God have, intended them have to structural to content right. that they'll live long lives and reproduce for many, many years right. without any added. Right, all right. The industrial food production system hasn't helped sometimes in promoting uh, locally produced uh, healthy food. And how does Levelldale Farms approach stewardship not only of the animals but of and with uh, that in mind? Well, we do a number of things, and uh, I'll start into this area, and as you know, it's, it, it's easy to walk off or be misinterpreted a little bit in terms that people use in producing livestock and fruits and vegetables that are, don't all have the same meaning to each other. Right. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, I want to be uh, careful that I'm saying the right things, but we try to do things in a way that I think of as very naturally. Now, I'm not saying that other ways or using certain chemicals are bad. I think there are many things we don't really know. Right. But what we do in like raising beef, the beef that we produce for others to consume, that's a segment of what we do. We, we primarily create genetics that will perform so well and, and be great for consumption that we're selling those genetics to other breeders around North America primarily, but somewhere, sometimes outside of North America as well. But the, the offspring that we feed to consume, we don't uh, give them antibiotics in the food or anything like that. We don't give them extra hormones. Uh, it's more of a natural process. Now we do feed in addition to grass, after they've been weaned, we do give them additional grain, right. which we think, personally, uh, we do grass-fed as well as grain-fed, but I, I've always liked the taste of grain-fed right. a little okay. bit better, yeah. and uh, uh, I'm happy for people to go either direction, but I just like to let them know what they're getting. Right. It's like when we sell 
cattle to other breeders. I'm wanting them to be sure they know what they're getting. You know, and, and it, well, they know, you know, they, some people say they want something, but then they'll buy something that doesn't match up with that. What and, they want. I, and so I always like to show them and make sure they look through the herd and really analyze things to get a better feel for it. You know, we, we also raise uh, classic corn and soybeans and rotate crops much more than many people do and, and use very little chemicals. And we've actually done some farming that depending on Again, terminology. Right. Some people call it chemical free. Some people call it organic. Right. Uh, the word organic, that's you know, a, is, a is kind one. of depending on who you're talking to, right. means different things. And chemical free means different things. But I think the main thing is we're wanting to not overdo putting right. things on the ground. We we run cattle after the corn is picked. We we often uh, put in fall crops we will actually fly on seed over our corn. And so it'll come up with beets or rye after the corn is picked, and then we graze cattle on that, and oh, then they, oh, they fertilize that land oh, right, right, right. by walking around and having bowel movements on right. that land. Exactly. And, and so it's, we try to naturally use the, the territory and, and look at things as though this is gonna be in the family another 150 or 70 years from now and you want to take good care of it. And that is a that is a, such a awesome perspective, um, and obviously a challenging one. But the Mathers have done it so far. So they, far, that life is, life goes on, and you can't uh, pr project all outcomes. But uh, all right, now let me ask you this: the champion Shorthorn Bull for 2017. How much taller is he in, than Custodian? I would say he's probably uh, at least 10 inches tall. Okay. Maybe more than that. Maybe a full foot or better. And uh, uh, would be at the same age probably weighing 200 pounds more at a year or 300 pounds more at a year. Okay. But that was not because they have, you know, again, they were bigger like that in the 20s. Right, right. And then they brought them down. And then, down, then they brought them down. And then they, and then they just, took them back up. That is fascinating. And then they moderated it a little bit the last few years. There's been a little more uh, in, in cattle breeding to put emphasis on utility traits of common other things that they do better if they're not, you know, if, if they're all six, 10 guys that, that require tons of nutrition, they're not gonna do as well just turning them out in the pasture. Okay. And so we want cattle that can eat the grass in a pasture and walk and cover as much territory as they need to get the food they right. need and be healthy and maintain themselves. So you're not taking feed out and scooping it out to them. So right now, Levelldale beef is is it uh, available um, in Mason City or are there, you have a CSA for the beef? Well, we we have. Uh, uh, you can go on our website, Levelldale.com. www.level L-E-V-E-L-D-A-L-E dot -E -E com and contact us if you want. We don't have a sales staff sitting around trying right, to right. sell it. We don't produce large volumes. I've put together another company recently called Durham Country Beef and I, I'm thinking and we've got some other people that buy some of our genetics that would uh, agree to produce livestock the way we do right. and avoid what I think may be unnecessary things that would make it perhaps less healthy so that they will fit our program and be able to mass produce more. Right. So I'm, I'm working on that possible transition in the near future. Uh, contact us either by email or phone and we'll, we'll work with them and have it uh, custom cut to their desires. Fantastic. All right, well thank you so much. Thank you.